most small businesses, most startups fail maybe within three to five years. If we sell out, you get 100,000, you get 900. And he says, yeah, why not? As we sat over a cup of tea in his, in his kitchen, we got a metaphorical knock on the door from the Ministry of Defence who said, uh, can you do covert tracking? Ambrose Bank are interested in buying you. By which time, when my colleague told me this, I said, they're ridiculous. I find that, uh, especially when there's a lot of young people, they've been told by their firms, particularly like lawyers and accountants, go out there and network. This is the Leeds Business Podcast, and I'm your host, Phil Fraser. I'm a business sounding board. Think somewhere between a business coach and a business mentor. Do you, as a business owner, need someone to discuss your business problems with? Well, drop me an email. I can help you find the answers. This week's episode is slightly different as we meet one of the Leeds business community's most well-known faces, Colin Glass OBE. Colin shares his expertise on topics like what makes a great business founder? What funding options are available for business? What is a non-exec director and why you might need one? And of course, Colin teaches us how to be a great networker. Before we start, I have one simple request of you please hit the follow or subscribe button on the app that you're listening to this on. That's it. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's go. Today's guest on the Leeds Business Podcast is Colin Glass OBE. Good morning, Colin. Hi, morning. Now, Colin is slightly different to our our usual guests on here as he's, um, well, if you're in the Leeds business community, you'll invariably know Colin. He's a non-exec director. He's a business mentor, particularly with startups. He's an angel investor, he's a a sweat investor, um, he's a networker, and in 2017, he was given an OBE for services to business startups and entrepreneurship. So Colin's got a brilliant view across lots and lots of different businesses, and hopefully lots of learning that he'll be able to share with us. So, So let's start with a simple one. What would you say are the common themes you see in successful businesses? Well, I think the main one is the caliber of the entrepreneur. Uh, that sort of overcomes everything else, usually. Uh, I think that's very important. Um, obviously, they've got to be passionate about their idea or their business, uh, but they've also got to be realistic and, quite frankly, to, to listen to advice uh, when uh, when taken, really, uh, I think that's very important. And I mean, that's a very, you know, I'm a business coach, I'm a business mentor, the same as you. How many times do you find business owners who, who won't listen to, to good advice? To be fair, not that many, but there are some that it doesn't matter how much you tell them and from, you know, a lot of experience, they just want to go on their own way, uh, which defeats the object of, uh, of, of trying to build a relationship. Uh, but it, it doesn't happen that many times, obviously, they go, but they really need to find a mentor um, that is has has experience in the field they're in, not necessarily in the specific field, but the level of business that they are in, really. Right, and I mean that is very very important. Yeah. As a as a mentor myself, I will deal with SMEs up to say a five million pound turnover because that's where I got into my business. Other mentors will have experience of much bigger businesses and PLCs and stuff like that. So apart from apart from the business owner themselves, what else makes a, a successful business? Well, I think um, planning, you know, you've got to have a, a business plan to start with and you've got to try and keep to that business plan, uh, but review it all the time. Sometimes you need to change. The, the word now is pivot, I suppose. Um, I think that that is important. Also, uh, and I would say this wouldn't I, as an accountant, financial control from the outset is very important. Uh, and the other thing is uh, connected with that, the correct amount of funding, uh, because if you're underfunded, you'll be chasing your tail all the time. OK, OK, brilliant, brilliant. So let's let's flip that question on its on its back then. What are the common errors or mistakes that you see in businesses? Well, I suppose in, in one sense, the reverse, people who don't listen to the advice, um, not prepared to put the um, to put the effort in uh, because it is a 24-7, sometimes physical, but certainly mental effort you've got to put in. Uh, and you've got to be realistic. Uh, 
you also do need to try and keep some quality of life. But in the early days of a business, quite frankly, uh, there's got to be a lot of sacrifices made. I know this myself, looking back to when I started, um, I didn't think about it at the time, but looking back, I realised how many sacrifices were made uh, and to some extent are still being made. And I think you find that the successful businesses uh, are, you know, or, or the successful entrepreneurs have got this drive and they have to be involved, if not physically, but certainly mentally all the time. You can't, it's hard to switch off. Right. So uh, those that are not prepared to do that, that is a problem. Um, and, and the other thing, and, and very important, is you've got to get around you a good team. Now, the team might be to start with only one person, um, but as you build it up, you've got to get a good team. And that is quite difficult to do because, you know, some people flatter to deceive uh, and, and you've got to be realistic. Uh, and, uh, but uh, I think that is also um, a common failing of businesses if they haven't got that team around them. OK, OK. And, and if you were if you were sort of talking generically, and I know it's different for different businesses, who would you say is going to be your key initial hires? Because obviously we can't go out there and and take on a CEO, at, you know, one hundred thousand pounds you know, a year straight away. What would you who would you see as the key hires in the early days? It depends on the on the type of business. Um, and uh, you, you, as you say, you can't go out and and get a high paid CEO, but quite frankly, they would be out of place in a small business. So it's often uh, young people who want to come along with you for the ride, if you like. Um, and sometimes you've got to incentivize them, perhaps not, you can't pay them the salaries, but uh, perhaps a small amount of equity, although you really do need to take advice on that and to think it through. Uh, I think the principle is there, but planning it and making sure that if you get it wrong, they're not, you know, you haven't got them tied into the, to the company. Uh, so, but, but the principle I think is, 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 is there. Okay. Okay. Let's just go back a, a, a couple of, a couple of sentences. You, you talked about um, you know, the danger of being underfunded. Um, if somebody's listening to this podcast and they want to go out and get funding, what are the, what are the best ways to, to get funding particularly for either a startup or an SME who's, who's in that growth phase? Well, as you, you're probably aware now, the government of the last, I don't know, two or three decades um, have realised that SMEs or starting with startups and then SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises, are the lifeblood of the economy because over the years, through international competition and, and, very, and, and technology, uh, the larger companies are, some of them are disappearing. So encouraging uh, SMEs is very, very important. And you can see all around you uh, the initiatives that the government is trying to take. And one of them is on funding. Um, and they started their development bank back in, I think, 2015, the British Business Bank, where they are trying to get uh, funding into small businesses where the banks who are going the other way and talk about helping small businesses but sadly don't do don't give that help in the way that they used to do for all sorts of reasons um but uh i, I think the british business bank and the, the funds that they have got both loan funds and equity funds are worth looking at um but there's also been the growth of the business angel movement because people uh over the years uh, got spare funding spare cash to invest and uh, up to in the last few years at least interest rates have been very low so you know they've been prepared to take a risk but it is a big risk from the investors point of view um, however there is a growth in that movement um, both formally and informally there are groups of angels um, and there are individual angels uh, they're not necessarily affiliated to a group. Um, and, uh, and so this is a, a good way of getting uh, funding in. But the, the small businesses should try bootstrap it uh, as, uh, as long as possible uh, using their own funds, fr friends and family, um, and uh, uh, just trying their best not to have to raise funds initially until they can see how things are going. 
uh, and it gives them a better opportunity uh, to plan that fundraising. It's, it's interesting you say that about bootstrapping and, and I bootstrapped my business. Um, a guest I had on, and it will probably be when this comes out, it'll probably be in last week's episode, was with a guy called Nigel Botterill, who actually talks it the other way around and says, actually, you should make sure you've got enough funds to do stuff because bootstrapping stops you doing stuff because you haven't got the money. I mean, how, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I think he, he's right. But the, there are, to my view, there are two or three, well, more than two or three stages. There are various stages. Uh, and one of them is to see how it goes because, sadly, the records show, the statistics show that most small businesses, most startups fail maybe within three to five years. Uh, if they get help, if they get advice, and if they get funding, they're likely to last longer. Um, however, uh, until you see how it's going, um, and I know this from experience of businesses I've tried to help, if you'd have gone in straight away, even if you'd have managed to raise the funding, and, and this has happened many times, uh, you know, they find they can't get into the market fast enough, uh, they've already structured it because they've got funding, and sadly, it goes the other way. So, you know, I, I think you've got to look at each one. I mean, there are various principles, obviously, but I think you've got to look at each business, um, what they're trying to achieve, the people, and then structure it accordingly in terms of funding. Right, right. And you've, you know, you've mentioned angel investment and, and you and I go to a, a number of angel investment meetings. Um, what would, if somebody was going out to get angel investment funding, what are you looking for in an angel investment pitch that makes you go, yeah, I, I want to get involved? Well, the pitch is important, but in the most, certainly in angel groups, as you know, um, it starts with a very a five minute or a 10 minute pitch. Um, and people have, or angels, most investors have a, a fairly uh, short attention span uh, because they're getting all sorts of ideas thrown at them. So you, the last thing you want to do is get too complicated. If it's a technology business, they don't really want to know about the technology, except in its very basic form at the initial stage. That comes later once you get down to due diligence. They're going to go on the person, uh, and that can be misleading. And you find that, you know, again, as you go forward, the, the person, how he presents, and the basics of it, and the marketplace. Um, so, you know, pitch decks should be, I don't know, a dozen slides and keep it simple, dumb it down, uh, because, you know, once you get the interest, then you can follow through. I think that's, that is the main thing. Um, so obviously, if you're talking to an individual angel, you've probably got, you know, you may have a one-to-one -one meeting and, and you've got more time. But with angel groups, they follow up with uh, due diligence meetings and, and that goes on. But, you know, you can't escape from the risk uh, but someday, on the, from the angel point of view, as we both know, <laughs> you have to take a decision. And uh, I've yet to met, meet the angels that are, uh, are winning on, uh, in terms of the numbers of investments. Uh, but as, as we all know, one investment can pay for all those that go wrong. And, uh, uh, and that's what we're all looking for. Yeah, the difficulty, the difficulty, yeah. it's easy finding the ones that go wrong. The difficulty is finding the one that pays for all the, all the ones that go wrong. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> There's one good thing about when you get angels together, it's great swapping some war stories. I mean, it is really, um, but, uh, um, you know, we're still there and you just got to give it a go, uh, and, and, and choose, and choose, uh, the ones that you feel are going to make it. But, only time will tell. Just as a sort of subdivision of angel investment, uh, and I know it's something you've you've done quite a lot of, is is um, sweat investment. So just just talk to our listeners a little bit about what sweat investment is and and how you how you tend to structure it. Yeah, well, this goes right the way back to a different era. Uh, dare I say, in the in the nineteen seventies, when we were starting out in accountancy practice, myself and a very good friend, a business partner, um, and we realised uh, in those days you weren't even allowed to advertise or pub um, or have any publicity for getting clients. So you had, and I'm sure we'll come on to networking, but you had to meet people and often deal with startups. And even as our very modest fees, a startup finds it very difficult to pay for advice, understandably. So much to my uh, 
partners, Chagrin, I suppose, uh, I said, look, uh, because I was absolutely fascinated by the stock market and uh, particularly uh, uh, an investment banker called Jim Slater at the time, who was investing in sleepy companies and trying to help them grow and build up. I said, look, I'd love to do this with no money, but what we can do is risk our fees and take a small sweat equity stake. Uh, and I said, well, how are we going to get paid? I said, well, there'll be other, you know, we had another partner and, and in any case, we had some income coming in. And, and, and that's how we started out. Unfortunately, fortunately, the first one was a great case study. Um, we could take up a whole episode talking about it, but it, it was a fantastic study. Uh, the people were right. It started in the back bedroom. Uh, this is a very long story short. And ultimately, I think after about 18 years of all sorts of fun, excitement, pivoting, call it what you like, we managed to sell it uh, in, a, in a rather bizarre fashion. But in um, by that time, I'd got 18 years more experience, so I could help through. And it, it, our little stake, uh, we had 10%, um, uh, which it only cost us two pounds because we didn't need any money to start with. We, the business could fund itself. Um, turned out to be okay, but um, you know, and we've done that a few times, but only a few times because, as I say, the statistics show that you're not going to find winners all the time. But the investment, believe me, it, we were keeping broadly time record well for our accountancy we needed to keep time records and we did keep time records to some degree but you can't because you've got to be available or we were available 24 7 in the same way and advice phone calls meetings uh, connections it's very hard to work it out and we were totally transparent as well and i remember saying to uh, my colleague in this business when we started off uh, I was telling him what we were going to do um, and I said we would like 10% and do not come back if we sell out for a million pound and we've got a hundred thousand pound in those days a million pound was a lot of money uh, and I said look you understand that if we sell out you get a hundred thousand you get nine hundred and he says yeah why not as we sat over a cup of tea in his in his kitchen and quite frankly but I would say this wouldn't I, I mean that makes absolute sense because and it's happened a few times, the main people will get most of the money, rightly so. Uh, and, you know, it doesn't matter that other people, not just us, but you bring investors. It's the whole point. You're bringing investors in, um, professional investors, VCs and what have you. You've got to work psychologically how much money, if you do sell out, are you going to be happy with? I mean, you know yourself, you've sold out. Um, and uh, most people don't change their... Uh, way of life totally not many people go out and buy yachts and do this that and the other uh, this is very psych there's a lot of psychology that goes with it and um, so that that's how we did it and we did it a few times and the way we structured it was to say we wanted to be able to subscribe a par for the equity now obviously if the business is more established it's just slightly more difficult but for pure startups it's quite easy you know you just put your you know, if it's a hundred pound company and we're getting 10% for us and we put our 10 pound in and that's it. And then we give them total service and hope that there'll be an end product. Now, as they grow and if they're successful, then we do get fees, but only in proportion to, or in timing wise, what they can get, i.e. often the entrepreneur is not getting a market rate salary for some time. Therefore, we don't get any fees. But once we get to the happy stage where the, it's getting a market rate salary or maybe more than market rate, we get a fee based on whatever is appropriate at the time as a, we'd probably be a non-exec director or the equivalent of at that time. And that's what uh, that's how more or less we structure it. OK, OK, that sounds great. Now, you've said that was you said your first one was a big success. And I, I want to talk to you about that. But before I do. I want to tell our listeners and viewers about the Leeds Business Podcast Fair Deal. The Fair Deal has two sides to it. Uh, my side of the deal is every week I bring you inspirational, motivational and fascinating Leeds business leaders like Colin, uh, totally for free. 
Your side of the deal, listener and viewer, has two parts to it. Part number one, I want you to recommend this podcast to one other person you feel will get benefit from it. And part number two, I'd like you to post a review of this show on the app that you're listening on. That's all you have to do. The Leeds Business Podcast Fair Deal. Sound like a fair deal, Colin? Absolutely. Um, and you've had some good people on in the past. Um, quite a few of them that I know. I know their story, but it's always interesting listening to them again. Excellent. Excellent. So Colin says it's a fair deal, so it's a fair deal. So Colin, tell us all about um, your first sweat investment and the success it led to. And I know it's a really, really long story, but let's let's try and keep it, keep it as short as we can. Okay. Well, the, the guy uh, I was introduced, as, as often happens, introduced by a friend. Uh, and uh, this guy, well, he was a research assistant at Leeds University in chemistry. But his hobby, he was a radio ham. There are be too many radio hams now for obviously a change in technology. However, he was brilliant on electronics. And he designed something which he told me was an RF clipper. And I said, what's that? That was my mistake. And he tried to explain. I said, forget it. Don't try and explain anymore. What do you want to do? He says, well, I know. This was before the internet. I know we can sell it in specialist magazines, in the back of the magazine. And, um, you know, I think it was going to be sold for about 30-odd pounds or so. And I can make it, blah, 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 blah. So I was like a Walter Mitty existence. that I was preaching to him. Uh, I said, well, you've got to sort of structure it right, set up this company, which we did. Uh, and as I said, we took 10%. And then he and his wife, lovely people, and I used to sit in their kitchen and, and we used to talk about the business and I used to write up the books. And we did, he sold it and the postman got very curious because more and more were being sold and he was designing new equipment and, and what have you. Uh, and it, because with radio hams they all talk on uh, they're not to talk i don't think they're allowed to talk about politics or religion but they can talk about their equipment they're real nerds and they were saying well the the, the date on clipper is what you need and so forth and so on and um, then he got to the stage where he needed to he, he said look i um i can't do this anymore uh, part-time because he was doing it part-time with his job he said I've got to leave my job and I went shock horror he was married I was single then he was married with two little kids and a mortgage I said you know there's big risk but we we he, know he was keen so we got a little unit and uh, he started employing two two uh, uh, people on the production side and we went and so it went on and then um, he was doing some technology that it was involved with direction finding and uh, at that time and i can talk about it now because it's many many years ago um he got a metaphorical knock on the door from the ministry of defense who said uh, can you do covert tracking um and he said yeah i can do that and that opened a whole new thing which we couldn't talk about at the time and uh all of a sudden uh the guy from the government or whatever department uh sort of he he passed on our name to various european countries and what have you um and uh, it got bigger and bigger but of course we had, we couldn't really talk about it and we had one non uh, mainstream product which was a debugging device if a room was bugged we could find where it was and as a result of this uh, and I, unfortunately, I've got to keep the story short. But as a result of this, one of our contacts said, um, well, uh, Hambro's Bank are interested in buying you. By which time, when my colleague told me this, I said, they're ridiculous. I mean, they're a merchant. As he said, who's Hambro's Bank? I said, well, I said, they're a merchant bank. I said, I know them. They're second to Rothschilds at the time. Um, I said, he said, oh, well. I said, but they won't be interested in us. There must be some mistake. I said, but do me a favour. Indulge me. I said, I said, what do you mean? I said, well, this is what will happen. We'll go down to London. The winers and diners. And then they'll find we're two little hacks from Yorkshire and <laughs> send us back home. I'm not going to do that. I said, just we'll have a day out. And we did. We went down. Seventh floor in uh, where it was, Tower Hill. And then the story, um, as we over lunch, I think it was, 
I realised there was a bizarre reason why they wanted it. They had a company which was a more a consultancy company, uh, and they had one guy who was our contact, who was their technical support unit, um, and they must have said to him, "Look, we're going to build this company up. If you know any potential acquisitions." Um, and he used our debugging device, uh, and so he thought, well, I'll try this. Um, and so he put our name forward. They decided we were good enough. They bought the company, and uh, we went on the board uh, of their subsidiary. And the first meeting, there was about 10 of us, and I looked at the other end of the, the, uh, the room, and I thought I recognised the guy at the end. He was a deputy chairman of Ambrose Bank who was sitting on the subsidiary board. And I thought, unbelievable, where we started off in, in Headingley and yeah. in, in the guy's uh, kitchen and, uh, and, and here we are now. So, that you know, if we could get ones like that every time, they would be great. But there have been other good ones. I mean, I was fortunate enough to be involved with Jonathan Strait uh, and Strait PLC, which we took from a startup. He was a great entrepreneur. Uh, we took it from startup all the way to flotation on AIM uh, and one or two other interesting stories. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. And it's interesting, actually, because when we see angel investment pitches, you know, one of the questions often is, you know, where do you see the exit? And, you know, that would never have been on the, you know, on the, it, they just wouldn't have thought of, of going there. So it's, you know, exit can come in all sorts of different places. So, Brilliant success story. So you know what my next question is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> tell us the, I'll tell you what, tell us, tell us the ones that, that didn't work, that you were surprised didn't work. Because I know we, we were saying, oh, this is going you know, to be a world changer. Tell us some of the ones that maybe you thought this really is a goer and just for whatever reason didn't, didn't happen. Uh, well, I suppose there's been so many over the years um, for all sorts of reasons. But one of the bigger ones that didn't go well um was when i was there sadly he's passed away now uh, uh, a, a character called melvin levi who got involved in buying a stake in a i think it was on the usm then and he knew i was fascinated and interested in in the public company field uh and he was a straight talker and he said look um he said, I want you to help me with this. And I said, well, you've got your own advisors. No, no, no. He said, I want you to help me with this. Uh, and he bought a, there was a company called Blanchard's and he bought an 18% stake in this company. Either way, the, the, that went okay. And all of a sudden we've got loads of publicity and it was all very exciting. And it was a mini conglomerate, including they had a, uh, Moises Stevens, which was the florist to the Queen Mother, and amongst the uh, uh, amongst their their subsidiaries. Either way, uh, the bank decided they needed an experienced chairman and brought in a guy called Trevor Barker, who just I think sold the Crowther Group to Collarol for about two hundred million pounds, and he came in as chairman. But the whole thing needed sorting out. And I was only, I was non-exec, but on the fringe. But I thought, I can't understand, you know, they've got all these internal accountants and everything. It just doesn't seem to be right. So, either way, Trevor Barker decided to sell off a lot of the subsidiaries and turn it into a cash shell. But halfway down the line, I realised, to my horror, and I couldn't understand how the emperor in the new curves, why couldn't anybody else see that this was not going to be a cash shell? It was going to be there's going to be a deficit and it was all going to go down the swanny right and there'd be a lot of bad publicity and i absolutely was you know beside myself however making it worse at the time trevor barker wasn't well and decided to step down and as there was only myself and melvin i was left literally holding the baby uh, and it took me about seven years purely scared stiff that you know it was all going to go and we managed to the remaining um subsidiary that kept us going and then managed to sell that and it became a total uh delisted uh shell so there was no big tragedy in terms of publicity or anything like that and it was completely delisted with some shareholders 
and we cleared all the creditors and whatever. And then out of the blue, somebody took, uh, uh, somebody approached us and said, it was an experienced guy on the stock exchange that he, he wanted the shell. And I, I said to him, look, you, you know very well it's delisted. What good is it? He says, well, I've got a company I want to reverse into it. Uh, and you've got a shareholder list. So that's a good start. And which he did, a guy called um, Stephen Dean, uh, and he had already been on the stock market. And uh, all of a sudden, I find myself on the board of a company that's now operational. He's, he had a, um, a company building houses in, in, in Cambridgeshire. Uh, and all of a sudden, I was getting a fee uh, for being a non-exec director. In the end, I stepped down um, and uh, the company is still going, as far as I'm aware, in a different guy. Sadly, he passed away as well. Um, and uh, it was a some complicated deal, but I'm still getting some, a few dividends from this this company. So, you know, what was nearly a dead duck uh, turned out to be okay. Yeah. But there are many more, and I can't remember all the names, to be <laughs> honest, uh, that sadly, for one reason or another, never yeah. made it. Sometimes about the people, sometimes about the marketplace, and things that yeah, happen. Yeah. yeah, just just something you've mentioned there, and I think for the for the benefit of our of our listeners, you talked about a non exec. You've been a non exec in lots of different places. Just explain the role of a non exec director and and why a company would need one, and what sort of size a company would need to be to need one. So, what does a non exec do? Well, <clears throat> a non exec is supposed to bring a. Uh, a sort of independent outside view to help um, the executive board. Uh, and so the non-exec needs to have experience relevant to the company. It doesn't have to necessarily be in the same field. It sometimes helps if he is, obviously. Um, but other times it's because of his general experience at the level. Now, most of the companies that I've been a non-exec of, um, are companies that I've helped in the founding and growth of, so I have known about it. Um, and but because of my other interests at the level we're talking about, this, uh, you know, um, uh, I could bring that to bear. And also, I'm very keen on bringing contacts as well to try and help um, uh, to, to try and help the company go forward. Um, and uh, so that's the main thing, but. As I say, according to the level of companies, it's it's, it's different. It, it, uh, it, 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 sometimes you're a sort of part-time executive rather than a non-executive. And, and legally, it doesn't matter what you call. You are jointly and severally liable alongside um, all the other directors. So you've got, you know, often there are internal disputes, squabbles, politics, uh, and you've got to try and be sort of the, 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 the moderator in these, um, not just to help the company, but to make sure that, you know, you're not liable for something that, uh, and it, you read about it in the paper, uh, that uh, uh, a rogue um, CEO has been doing. So, um, you know, there's a lot of responsibility there. Uh, but sometimes you can act, you know, even if you're acting as an advisor, and you've got to be careful legally about this as well, because even if you're not on the board, um, you can be classed as a shadow director if something goes wrong. So it, 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 there is a lot of responsibility. It's not just a title from that point of view. And, and what sort of size company do you think needs needs a non-exec? I think any company, you can call them non-execs, but uh, any, uh, well, take my own case, I'm very careful if, if I'm going to join the board of, of a, a small company, because if it goes wrong, sadly, um, the publicity um, doesn't do you any good at all if you're actually on the board. So that, that's something to be aware of. Uh, on the other hand, if you're not on the board, you've got to be careful not to be drawn in in a situation as a shadow director. So it's, it's a bit of a balance in that sense. But I think all companies that are trying to grow and expand uh, should look at having some either say formal non-exec or advisor close to the company um, which is what i've tried to do when i'm helping small companies all the time but uh, uh, there are advantages and there are dangers as well that you've got to be aware of so anybody looking 
I was going to say anybody looking to be a non-exec therefore needs to do their own due diligence in the same way that uh, a company would do the due diligence on a non-exec. Absolutely. Now, once you get to a certain level, um, there are courses run by the IOD and I think some other organisations which are quite costly on how to be um, a non-exec, which if you're at a certain level, um, then it might be worth investing in because some people who had uh, good careers as an executive director in a company want to have a follow-on portfolio career um, and are looking for a, a non-execs. Now, I've seen some good friends and contacts who have done this uh, and, and their reputation goes before them uh, and they've got two or three. I can think of one person in particular who was with one of the big four accountants who got some very good non-exec work and I'm sure added a lot of value. Uh, and these were, were established companies uh, that really hadn't got non-exec and should have had perhaps a long time ago, but he was an ideal uh, candidate. And there are other um, uh, good ones. I mean, I know there's a friend of mine who stepped down recently as, as a, a CEO and is looking for non-exec work, but it, it's not that easy to find it at the right level. So you've got to start somewhere. Every week on the Leeds Business Podcast, we ask our guests to give us a how-to. So over to you, Colin, and what are you going to teach us how to do? Well, I don't think people will be surprised, but I suppose networking has got to uh, be one of the things. I mean, when I started out, uh, it was something na natural. I don't think it, uh, it was called networking as such. Uh, and now, of course, not only is it widespread, but it's become an industry, I think, and there are companies doing networking as well. I think the main thing is you, uh, you go, you've just got to like talking to people, um, and it's all about building relationships. The worst thing about networking is trying to make a direct sale. Everybody knows, ultimately, you hope it's going to involve um, a commercial arrangement somewhere down the line, but the worst thing you can do is you know, start talking to somebody and trying to, to make the sale, and some people do that. Uh, when you go, you've got to be natural, be yourself, and be confident, and that's sometimes not easy. You, you can go to a room, you don't know anybody, and uh, you're not used to sort of uh, moving into a conversation that two or three people are having, uh, but it can be done, and after all, Everybody's there for the same reason. Uh, and uh, I, I think you've got to be confident and do that. Uh, and, and you've got to sort of take your time to build these relationships when you're there and, and talk to them and ask the other person about themselves. Do not talk about yourself until effectively they ask you. And um, be, be modest as well, but equally be a bit savvy that you want them to be interested in what you're doing obviously so that the relationship can continue so I think that is um, I think that's important uh, and try and, and be helpful and try and make introductions not for any direct gain I, I do try and do that and uh, over the years obviously as you build up contacts you can you can do that so I, I um, but now I find that uh, especially when there's a lot of young people, they've been told by their firms, particularly like lawyers and accountants, go out there and network, which is uh, uh, is quite daunting for some of them, uh, but some with better personalities. And, and this is good fun as well. There's a lot of interesting uh, uh, groups, uh, interesting things that go on. Um, but some of the networking goes on at what might be called... Um, a, a conference or, or a meeting, an interesting meeting. It's amazing who, who you do meet and it is very, well, I find it very rewarding in terms of interpersonal relations as, as well. So I hope that helps. There you go. Anybody on the Leeds business scene who hasn't networked with Colin, that's a rarity. It's a rarity because Colin, everywhere I go, Colin's there. Everywhere everybody else goes, Colin is there. So, uh, yeah, if you're going to learn networking, learn from the best. 
So the other the other thing we ask our guests to do is give a shout out to another Leeds business. So who are you going to give a shout out to? So I was introduced to a guy called Michael Crinian, who was an ex-school teacher. Uh, and I was introduced by, we had a mutual uh, contact. And in a former life, he'd been a product uh, developer. And he, he had noticed the rising anxiety levels in children and had devised uh, or had this idea of, of devising a, uh, a standalone unit that emits light pulses, helps your breathing and therefore reduces anxiety. That's the layman's explanation of it. And so he had the idea um, and I liked him from the outset because he, he was uh, um, very articulate, had a good sense of humour and was willing to listen and we worked together. And we, it was a really, it is really a good case study from the idea. Um, and I was introduced by Richard Hall, of PDM, who's a, an experienced product designer. So, you know, that was a good introduction, really. And he had the idea, he designed it with all the usual problems that you have. He started to work with then found um, uh, uh, production, someone who could produce it. Uh, and then we had to go through the, the idea how we're going to sell it uh, and it's up and running and we are selling it. It's called Luma uh, and people who use it, because as you probably know, mental health and well-being is one of the biggest growth industries and it's surprising how many people do suffer from anxiety and, and it's working. But what I like about it is that if I come up with an idea, I can um, and say, look, send this person an email, I'm very pedantic, I like to check, make sure it, it's right. He's very, very good at that. He, he can go to a meeting on and, and, and he's fine uh, or a conference. And, and generally, I think um, it's really good case study. All we need to do now is sell more of them. But uh, uh, the, the, the company's called Mind Body Goals. Um, and um, it's just a pleasure working with him. So that's half the battle. Okay, and I've got a small amount of equity, and I am a non-exec director, so I, I feel confident enough. I hope I'm not putting any lockers on it now uh, to uh, to be a formal sort of uh, part of his board. There will be there will be links to um, Luma in the show notes, so if anybody wants to go and buy one, they can do. And you know, every penny every penny you spend, some of it goes into Colin's pocket. So there you go. <laughs> Well, ultimately, we hope. Yeah. <laughs> Colin, it's been absolutely fantastic talking to you today. By the way, I'm not get, I'm, I, I don't get. Pe it's the same. No, it's all right. It is the same model. I haven't had a penny out of it yet. So there. We there are. you go. There Next. you go. If you buy, if you buy part, if you buy the product, Colin will be able to eat because he's not had any fees for it. <laughs> <laughs> Colin, it's been absolutely brilliant speaking to you today and I hope our listeners have enjoyed it. Thank you very much indeed. Well, I've enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found it interesting, inspiring and of use. To make sure you don't miss out on any future episodes, please subscribe to the show. Go on, do it now. Do it now before you go off and do something else. Thank you. Much appreciated. Oh, and don't forget our fair deal. See you next week.